This is this is Craig Radio. You're on the air. Hello. Hi, Dennis. Yes. How are you? I'm 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 confused. I've been trying to get through, but I, it's the weird connections. Oh, that's odd. This is the first time it rang through. Yeah. Well, that's weird. I mean, we're having a problem here anyway with some with communication because our internet's been out for three days. Oh. So. So we have no Wi-Fi, and I think the the some of the connect communication stuff here is not is weak or something. So I, I've been trying to find out what to do. But here we are. Here we are. Remember those great days in the '60s when not only did we have great Buckingham hits, but there was no internet <laughs> <laughs> because the internet's exactly. evil. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. There was no social media either. Yes. Right. Yes. Let me like do. We didn't have to rely on the electricity coming through the wires. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, let yeah. me let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We're very happy that our featured guest for this evening is here. He is a singer. He is a writer. He's done a little bit of everything, and you know him as the voice of the Buckinghams. We're very excited to welcome the one and only Dennis Tufano to the show. You're on the air live with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome, Dennis. Thank you very much, Terry and Tiffany. Thank you. You know, I, I loved your music growing up, listening to it. And I didn't realize at the time when I was growing up in, in Rockford, Illinois, that uh-huh. you were you were just down the street. I didn't know you guys were from <laughs> Chicago. Oh, really? Yeah. You probably thought we were English or something, right? I, you know, I did. It's the name Buckingham's. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. you wore yeah. the, the military garb once in a while. And it was kind of right. like Gary Puckett and Union Gap or the Raiders or whatever. A little bit. And I just right. thought maybe you guys looked a little British, too, you know? Well, I think that uh, a lot of people kind of uh, put on the, the British cloak uh, from 63 on because yeah. it was uh, quite an influence on everybody. I think it influenced our music and, and how we approached doing, uh, you know, sounds in the studio because the Beatles uh, introduced a whole new level of, of recording. So Yeah. Well, not only did you have to battle the Beatles, I guess there was uh, some battling going on with you guys replaced each other on the charts with the Monkees. Yes, well, I, kind of a drag came out uh, in 67, February of 67, went to number one and knocked the Stones and the Monkees into two and three. <laughs> so, so we felt pretty good about our, our yeah. status at that time, uh, considering it was our first big hit. Yeah. And it went to number one. So, yeah, we were quite jazzed. You ever get together with your old pals and be like, remember when we were battling each other in the charts? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, actually, some years ago, we did a, uh, actually, Marty Greb, who was our keyboard player, uh, who passed away a couple years ago. Uh, in 2015, I uh, put together a, uh, a benefit for him <clears throat> because he was in uh, health, had health, health issues. Mm-hmm. And so we put together a benefit, and I thought the best way for us to, to do this, to make money for him, was to do it in Chicago and, and, and invite all the bands from Chicago that had hit records mm-hmm. and make a concert of all of us on the stage for the first time ever mm. at the same time. And that's exactly what we did. So it was the Eyes of March, the Shadows of Night, the, uh, <clears throat> I mean, every band from Chicago that they had record, Jimmy Sons, uh, New Colony Six, uh, just everybody that, and, and it was the first time, I think it, in 40 or 50 years that all those bands played a concert together in Chicago and everybody went nuts so it was a it was a great deal it was the first time actually our drummer John Polis passed away in 1979 Uh Uh, and so uh, but we had Danny Serafin from Chicago play drums with us on this and uh, because it's it's so obvious that you know we have the same kind of DNA going on and uh, and and it was the first time that Marty, myself, Carl, and Nick were actually played together, and uh, everybody actually saw four of the uh, surviving members of the Buckinghams wow. perform together, wow. which they hadn't seen for a very long time. So it was quite an emotional, and the the uh, amount of expertise that came out of every group was unbelievable. There was an energy that carried us all through it. So yes, we do. And then I actually performed with Carl and Nick, you know, because uh, Carl and Nick are are the Buckinghams now, yeah. right? Uh, and uh, and uh, we hadn't really played together for a while. And the PBS did a thing called uh, uh, Cornerstones of Rock, and uh, they still have it, I think, on on the PBS site. And it was it was exactly what we did 
uh, at Marty's benefit. Well, they had every group from Chicago come up and play, and we were closing the show. And so uh, since Carl and Nick were doing the Buckinghams for all these years, I said, okay, you sing so many songs, and I'll sing so many songs. Right. You know, why not? You, you know, I mean, there's no reason not to. So so we did that, and it came off very well. And, uh, and, I, and, and I, I was happy about it because so many people think that the reason I'm not in the band is because why'd you leave the band? Yeah, there's right, always that. Right. Was, yeah. And I said, well, there was no band to leave. We disbanded yeah. in 71. And so for 11 years, I was a solo artist. Uh, and uh, Carl and I did a couple of recordings uh, with Lou Adler in the 70s. But that kind of wore thin. So uh, I, I, I couldn't go back and do the band again in the 80s because I already established myself as a solo artist. So, uh, but it all worked out pretty well, you know. Once the once the potholes got <laughs> filled in, right. well, uh, what is that like when you along. step out on your own? Because I don't imagine there's any like getting nervous or anything because you're you're stage professional. But you, you, the guys are not. There's nobody to blame if anything goes wrong. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no, there isn't. No, I actually I actually uh, uh, function very well on uh, new challenges. And, and and that was uh, part of the whole. Uh, I mean, even the the, <clears throat> the structure of becoming a Buckingham. When I when I decided that music was going to be something I wanted to get involved with, uh, I jumped right into it, mm -hmm. knowing nothing. And we were in an acapella group. We sang, you know, uh, doo wop stuff and uh, uh, all the vocal group things. And that's when John Polis, the drummer who started the Buckinghams asked me and this other guy George Legro to to be the singers in the band because they didn't have anybody who could sing. Yeah. And so and I jumped into that. And then right in the middle of that just before we recorded uh George Legro uh, we were a duo basically uh, singing in front of the band. He got drafted and I became the default lead singer in less than 4 days. He got drafted on Monday and we had gigs on Thursday, Friday and Saturday. So I had to like pretty fast turn over to be uh, you know having the support of another singer with me right. to go for it myself right and, well, I, and so I, I think I've always had that kind of uh, I like the the idea of being you know challenged yeah so it worked out fine well was there ever a time to where you joined another group or sang with another singer and you just kind of didn't get along and kind of didn't work out uh, not really no uh, there was a time in the in, in the 70s uh, when uh, we, we we stopped recording, we did a couple albums with Lou Adler, and that was a great time. We were singer songwriters, Carl and I, and uh, and we had we made some good records with him, but we we, we couldn't get charted. The uh, music was changing drastically in the seventies, and uh, what was interesting about that is that we uh, I don't know I, I, he actually Lou Adler tried to hook me up with John Batdorf if you remember Batdorf and Rodney mm -hmm. yeah sure in the 70s yeah the songwriting duo and we worked together a little bit and wrote a couple of songs together and stuff but it really didn't the chemistry wasn't right yeah. it wasn't like a bad deal it just wasn't right and we both looked at each other and said no you know it's not like it's. we both had partners that we got along with before and it didn't fit yeah. uh, and I never had uh, I never have a problem with being with other people playing uh, which is one of the fun parts about being a solo act, is that you get to work with a lot of different people, and uh, and there's not that band dynamic anymore, and uh, and I think that that's that that's been very helpful for me uh, to maintain uh, you know because uh, I in the Buckinghams nobody I never wasn't Dennis Stefano in the Buckinghams yeah you know like like Tommy James and the Shondells Gary yeah. Puckett and the Union Gap so it took me a while it took me about three years when I came back. To sing again uh, took me about three years to let people understand who I was. And yeah, what I, I was had wondering done. about that. that. That could be a problem because, like, yeah. I, I interviewed Bo Donaldson and the Haywoods, and yeah. I wasn't too much of my research, I guess. And after like five minutes of the interview, I realized I wasn't talking to the lead singer because Bo Donaldson wasn't <laughs> the lead singer. <laughs> 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 That's right. And, and the first time I worked with Bo, and uh, it was like. Uh, he had the singer with him, and I was like, "Wait a minute, why did they call this the Bowdoin?" <laughs> <laughs> it's like so. It was like an interesting thing, but that, but you know, in that the period that those bands got together and came out, uh, that's the kind of naming that people had. That that was their 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 you know, yeah, nom de plus, and they uh, they uh, 
you know, everybody had different things, you know. It's like it was either the Almond Brothers, the Righteous Brothers, or, you know, whatever it was. Sure. Uh, the Walker Brothers. I mean, you put a couple of people together and you could have brothers, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so it was, uh, but I have to say that, that my experience as a solo artist has been very, very, very uh, rewarding uh, because, it, it, again, it, it fits right into my challenging days, which uh, is always a challenge to walk up there on your own. And, and just, you know, give them what you got yeah. instead of relying on the band or another guy or anything. And uh, and I had great opportunities. In the 80s, I had actually stepped away from singing uh, in the late 70s. I had, in the, well, 79, uh, I wrote uh, the music uh, for Bernie Taupin's album, uh, He Who Rides the Tiger. And that's what I was mostly doing was was behind the scenes. I was right. writing and doing background vocals for people and just kind of working in Los Angeles. And uh, but then in, uh, in uh, 79, I just felt like I just had to step back from music because I, I, I wanted to sing again on my own, but I didn't know what to do, what to sing, and mm -hmm. how to come back. And because the, the, uh, Carl and Nick wanted to put the band back together, and I said I didn't want to be a Buckingham again because I had invested so much time in just right. being me. So, so I said, you know, you have my blessing, go do that. So I was sitting there going, what am I going to do? And uh, and so I, I started to act. I wanted to be an actor for yeah, a long time. You so I started did a lot of acting. Yeah. You had very a lot of credits yeah. here. Yeah, I, I I dove right into it, and we got very very fortunate and lucky on a couple of breaks. You know, it's a tough little business to crack into, but I, I made a living, which was unbelievable, and I was like really happy doing what I was doing. But I was still burning inside to sing. And, and luckily for me, doing acting, I had to look good. I had to keep myself in shape. I also had to keep my voice in shape because I was doing a lot of voiceover work, too, for movies and things. Right. So, so it was a great time that I spent away from music, but I didn't abuse my voice. So then when I felt like coming back, you know, but in 1982, I got a call from Tom Scott, the great jazz sax player from the L.A. Express, uh, who I had worked with uh, on uh, Lou Adler's label. And uh, he said that he was doing this tour with Olivia Newton-John. And he said, uh, he says, I, I know you're a, a lead vocalist, he says, and a soloist, he says, but he says, I think because of your acting skills and your singing, that maybe this might be a good gig for you because she needs someone who could sing backgrounds, but also who could step up with her and do duets from her, you know, big hits, yeah. from Greece and from Xanadu. Mm -hmm. And so I went and auditioned, and Olivia was there for the audition. And, uh, and it was weird because I hadn't auditioned in years. <laughs> and it was kind of a nerve-making situation, especially when I opened the door. And, you know, at first I saw a couple of musicians I knew, so I felt comfortable. But then the other door opened and Olivia walked in. Yeah, and she's, yeah. Not, she's not exactly ugly, you know. She's, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. yeah. I mean, her presence, her presence alone is a little bit, you know, overwhelming. And here I had to prove myself to get this job. And she was going to sing with me. And I'm thinking, this is just ridiculous. This is a hard way to come back to singing. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I did the audition, and it went very well. We did Suddenly, the love song, which mm -hmm. was the scary part, and because it's a very, very emotionally uh, charged song. And uh, we did it, and uh, at the time, her, mu her musical director and, uh, and choreographer uh, uh, Kenny Ortega, who later became a director. Also. Oh yeah, we know yes. him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He came. He came up to me after I did my audition. He says, "I don't care what anybody else goes in there and does. What I just saw made me sweat." Yeah. He yeah. says, "You got the job. I don't care what happens." Well, if you'd have been, so uh, like, if you'd have been lucky, you know, I heard it when she was singing with John Travolta. That he couldn't hit the high notes, so she would pinch his butt. <laughs> she would just, just <laughs> grab a piece of his butt and just pinch it, and you know. Well, you know, I wish I would have known that then. I would have maybe tried to hide the high notes, you know. Uh, <laughs> now, you sang Suddenly. But Wasn't that put out on a record with her and Cliff Richard, or am I wrong? Cliff Richards, yes. Yeah. Yes, Cliff Richards. That's, that's the song I had to learn from Xanadu. Mm. And, uh, but when we did it uh, live, it, there were sparks. And she was so great to work with because she was very open and, and easy to be with. Uh, she wasn't a diva at all. And so when we started working on the duets... Uh, and, you know, and I realized I'm getting a, a couple of up and ones here where I could actually, you know, step out from behind the scenes and be with her. And yeah. she, she pretty much commands the stage when yes. she walks on the stage. She's got this charisma. And uh, 
we just, uh, in, in a theatrical sense, we fell in love right. with each other. And, and every night that we did those songs, it looked like we were a couple. Well, I'm glad to hear yeah. that because we talked to Fee Wave yeah. all of the tubes, and he just said that she had fat yeah. ankles. <laughs> yeah, well, she does. She does have big ankles. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that's why she never tips over. <laughs> she, 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 she so, no, but that's that's just well, you know, well, Fee shouldn't be talking like that. He's got a name that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> no, I love you, Fee. Held my mic up and we did the last ooh, ooh, oohs of the song, but this night for some reason I dropped my microphone and moved in on hers. And it was just when I moved in on hers, she looked at me and she dropped her mic and we kissed. Oh! And it was like every night after that, at the end of that show, she came up to me. She says, "Dennis, that stays in the show." She says because that's what's been missing in that song. She says that th that couple professes their love to each other. And then nothing at the end happens. Wow. She said, so, and I was like, I saw oh, darn, I don't want to kiss you every night. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but I'm sure you really did. You just wanted to be more. Well, I, you know, I'm a professional. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I said, I'll do this, you know, for the sake of all mankind. <laughs> and if we have to, we can smoke a cigarette after the show. I mean, you know. <laughs> I, I think our hair was smoking when we finished the show. Yeah, wow. No, it was a great experience. And that, that's one of the rewarding things I said about being solo. Yeah. I get, I, uh, now I get to go out and work with, you know, the the best of the best, the the doo-wop groups, the the guys that started it, you know, the Jay and the Americans, and the, and the, the I mean, just everybody that I work with, the Vogues, it's it's uh, Bobby Rydell, uh, and Gary Puckett, and and all those all the guys, Gary Gary Lewis and the Playboys are yes. great. I work with them a lot, and and they do a great job. He's got a great band, and sometimes I do shows with them, and they back me up too, and they're really good. And so you know, too, you've got a family out there in, in fans. I've noticed on Facebook, you've got such a loyal following that they're like a family. And, yeah, and yeah. you know, they all know each other, right? Do they not all meet at the concerts? Right. And they, they, they meet at the concerts, and then they all they read about each other on Facebook. Yeah, and and they're amazing on Facebook. They really do. I mean, I have a problem with Facebook because I, I I'm not a, a techie. And I get a little confused every once in a while about when you know Facebook changes the face of the whole show. Right. And I go, wait, I used to, I used to click on this, and now it's not there. How do I, you know, communicate? But no, uh -huh. they all met, and they became f good friends, and they've started saying things like, "I can't wait till we can all go to the same show." Yeah. And and so and some of them do, and actually some of them have come on the cruises. I've gone on two week cruises uh, with Rocky and the Rollers out of Florida. Mm. And, and Johnny Tillotson's on that. Boom Boom Cannon's on that. Uh, Gary Puckett's on that. I mean, it's just amazing. Vito Pacone from the Elegance, uh, if you remember back, if sure. you can go all the way back to the 50s, when they did uh, Where Are You, Little Star. And they're still amazing. And I work with all these bands that are like, these group, vocal groups that are like 10 years older than I am. And they, they still plug in and get up there and kick on the stage and sing beautifully. So it's like an amazing uh, group of people out there that, that keeps you going, you know. Well, well your I whole thing started around 1968 with, uh, you know, kind of a drag, so you're kind of like the baby of the group. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> they, they call me Kid. And that's <laughs> that's really, they go, hey, Kid, you think you could sing, huh? Yeah. And I go, no, no, I know I can sing. Uh, but... Uh, no, but it's very funny because we, we get along great. It's like we were all from the same cloth, you know. It's, yeah. And and that's one of the things about being a, a solo artist is that you you get to hang with everybody. Right. And it's not like you have to go back to your little group and hang and talk. And uh, it's uh, the dynamic is very interesting. And and I. I, I really fell in love with Bobby Darren's music. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And I love you singing yeah. Beyond the Sea. I heard you singing Beyond the Sea on YouTube, and, and I loved yeah. it. Oh, yes. Uh, it's it's a great, great uh, volume of work, and uh, that's what actually brought me back singing uh, in uh, in the 90s. And uh, I said, you know, I'm going to do this. I was at my sister's house in Chicago, actually, and uh, she was playing CDs, and one of them on the, the, the turntable thing was... Bobby Darren, yeah, and I was walking around her house singing along to the CD, you know, as we do. And uh, she, at the end of it, she said, "Yeah, she said, you, are you aware of the fact that your voice is right in the same pocket 
And then when you were singing along with it, it sounded very comfortable in the same key and everything else. I said, no, I never thought about that. But as soon as I got back to L.A., I bought every CD that there was, a box set to Bobby Darin, sure. and, and took a year and uh, came up with actually about 90 songs that I really loved. And, of course, you can't do 90 songs in no. any show. <laughs> 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 so... Uh, but we, we, we worked it out and got it down to like 26, 27 songs and alternates in there and stuff. And I started, I uh, did a chronological show called I Remember Darren. Wow, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and it was amazing because there's so many different genres. There's the standards, there's blues, there's country, there's folk. Uh, yeah, and, and Darren you know, recorded great. even for Motown. He was on Motown for a while, which was yeah, surprising. While, yeah, Because yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he, used to, he used to travel from New York into Detroit because there was a club there that was a good club that helped break people, so uh, yeah, he he definitely uh, and he's got he's got some soul. He's got a lot of soul. Yeah. He's uh, his music. Uh, what he when he covered songs, they were different, and uh, so he he made a, a big impression on me. And uh, and when I started singing his songs, I was just blown away. I felt so comfortable, and so uh, so that's why uh, I even went to Chicago. Uh, back in the day there and I did uh, a live show and we recorded it and it became a, a live CD called I Remember Darren and so uh, yeah that's that's another thing if I was in a band all those years I would have never had that step out no, right. no. so I mean yeah, obviously so. everything kind of stopped for a while because of the lockdown but now that things are, are lighting back up are you do you well, yeah. have dates scheduled I mean what's going on well, for, it, for the yeah. future it looks like yeah look, well I was supposed to work at the end of this month but they just called uh, right after they sent me the contract and said that they may not be able to do it for some reason, mm -hmm. and they may move it up. So far, the whole in the last four months, every date has been changed three times. Yeah. Wow. Well, what about and that so, one? You got one coming up, like with Lou Christie. And, Stars of the '60s. I think yeah, it's in October. Yeah, that's coming up. Yeah, that's in October. October is when it seems to open up. Yeah. October, November. There's a couple of shows in December which may pick up again because if we don't get another spike. Uh, and they uh, they allow you know concerts indoors, so uh, but you know even out here now there's a little spike happening, and uh, sure. I'm wondering what's going to happen after the Fourth of July yeah. too, and I'm I'm hoping that we all stay pretty safe. I mean I've got all my shots, I'm housebroken. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in talking about how you did a little bit of everything, you know, acting and everything, I had read, and tell me if this is incorrect, because a lot of times, you know, you read stuff on the internet that's not true. I had read that you yeah. even did a little bit of stunt work. Is that true? Well, it was it was actually a uh, misinterpreted uh, thing that a, a, a public relations person did back in the day when I was doing some acting. Uh -huh. uh, I actually had to do uh, some physical running back and forth uh, on a set uh to to actually make another entrance from the other side and there was no way to get through it right and everybody when i did it i had to do it without knocking over lights and stuff because they were still shooting the scene and <laughs> I, I know all about it. that yeah and so i i had to sneak around and it was 110 degrees outside yeah. it was really ridiculous and 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 at the end of that shoot they said well I thought I was just hiring an actor, but I got a stuntman too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and somebody picked up on that. And, and yeah, I was at a concert, ready to walk out on the stage for a concert. And somebody said, and he was a stuntman. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'd have to roll out on my shoulder on the wow. stage, you know, and do some stunts. Well, you know, uh, the, the Buckinghams is known as, I, I hate that term, Sunshine Band. I hate that. I don't, I don't even know where yeah. they come up with it. But yeah. you guys did have some controversy if, if these notes are correct. Is it true that there was supposed to be a Buckingham's Day in Chicago and they canceled it because you guys supposedly had like some encounters with, with drugs or arrested a few times or something? What was that all about? Drugs in the 60s? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be the only one. Nobody ever did that. <laughs> no, I don't understand that. Uh, there was there was a thing uh, that happened. Uh, a couple of our roadies we had played in Iowa, and uh, and this was 1968 or nine, and uh, and a couple of our roadies left roaches in an airline liquor bottle. You know those little bottles. Right. Now we're they, not marijuana, right? A couple of roaches. I mean, you couldn't even get high off. Yeah. They were just little ashes. And for some reason, the the, the, the housekeepers turned it in, and and uh, Spirit Lake, Iowa 
thought that they had the biggest drug bust in the world. Oh. So it worked out pretty cool. And, and then Chicago that, uh, canceled your Buckingham's Day? Oh, yeah. Well, you know what they did was is they, the next day in the newspaper, in the Iowa News, it said Buckingham's arrested on narcotics charges. <laughs> And and everybody thought that we were now the cleanest group in the world, but we were heroin addicts. That's like saying <laughs> Daryl Hall and John Oates in a sex scandal. I mean, it, it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, so it it was it was very strange because we got acquitted because it was there was no you know not enough evidence. Yeah. But but the problem was is like nobody issued another uh, uh, you know an acquittal uh, 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 review. So we were we were uh, known as then, uh, you know, bad guys. Yeah, we were like bad guys because we were. But you know that the night that we played that show, which was the overnight when they arrested a couple of the guys, uh, it was four, four of us weren't weren't booked by it, but uh, a couple of the guys were arrested, and uh, in a in a small Iowa jail. <laughs> and the next night when we went to the to the concert, we were the stage was surrounded by about nine policemen. <laughs> and they were standing facing the audience right in front of us like they were the floodlights, you know. And and we were up there, you know, pretty worried because of what just happened, because it was not real, yet they're making a big case out of it when they call it narcotics. So so all of a sudden we're up there performing and of course it was announced on the radio that we were arrested for <laughs> marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> and, we were we were pelted on the stage with at least fifty or sixty joints. Wow! <laughs> and From all of a audience, sudden, your 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 booking manager started putting you on tour with the Grateful Dead. And well, you know, it's <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, yeah, Grape. It's funny yeah, that like, you, you know, it's funny that Terry mentions that because I actually wanted to ask you, uh, didn't you and Carl, when you guys were a singer songwriting duo, didn't you end yeah. up touring with Cheech and Chong? Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we did. We oh, did you about, were asking uh, for it. About eight shows, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We eight shows with them. Well, they were on the same label on old records with Lou Adler. And uh, and Lou had just produced our album in 72. And he said, you know what? He says, Cheech and Chong have a, you know, their album is selling like mad. And uh, I think it'd be great if we open the show so people can get to hear you guys. <laughs> you know, because you got a made a great record and how do we get you out there? So we said, yeah, let's do that. You know, well, it was a little rough and... Uh, going up front because uh, you know the uh, Cheech and Chong's audience didn't even know they were there uh, you know they were kind of like <laughs> yeah. and they kept yelling things up at the we were an acoustic act we had two acoustic guitars <laughs> and a bass player and and they kept doing you know hey where's Dave man <laughs> <laughs> they kept doing Cheech and Chong's act you know and it got to the point where I had to ask the audience I said, could you just shut up so we know we started playing? Because we can't hear ourselves yeah. if you're yelling like this. And uh, actually, Tommy Chong got really upset because he heard me saying those things to the audience. So he called Lou Adler and said, uh, Lou, Dennis is bumming our audience. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, man. And Lou said the same thing I said. He goes, I don't think they know they're bummed out. Yeah. <laughs> he, says, I, he says, don't worry about it. I think you'll be fine. And after the third show, we did about eight or nine of them, I guess, uh, everything went well. Uh, they were fine with us. They were, uh, Cheech is a great guy. And yeah, uh, yes. and the audience picked up on our music. And uh, and I, actually, it was probably the first three gigs were punishment for that Iowa. And what, <laughs> what Tom didn't realize is he was making bad blood, but you could have got him uh, some good stuff. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know. I could have rolled his joints for him. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So you even wound up like working in, in TV theme songs in a way. Did you do the song for Family Ties? Yes, yes. That was uh, actually uh, just when we were rehearsing the Olivia Newton-John tour, uh, Tom Scott had written the music, and Jeff Barry wrote the, the lyric for this new TV show that hadn't come out yet Yeah, uh, called Family Ties, and they wanted me and this girl, Mindy Sterling, who's a great voice, and we had a great time singing, uh, to, to be that couple, you know, to be the couple that, the, that were the parents. So we went in, and we had no idea, you know, they told us what the show was about. And so we went in and sang it. I think we did it in about three takes. It was wonderful. Mm. Uh, and and it came out really nice. And, uh, yeah, they, they it was on for the first 13 episodes, I think. Wow. And then Johnny Mathis loved the song and, and, yeah. and 
convince CBS to let him record it. And so they took our version off. But in some of the uh, reruns, if you get the first uh, season, uh, you'll hear me and Mindy Sterley singing. Yeah. Are you still getting royalties from that? I mean, lots of people say they get... Very know, little. Yeah. yeah, very little. Right? Because Some people get checks for a nickel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I've gotten checks for point zero one. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and, and, and I always put those on the wall because it reminds me right. <laughs> how well I did. <laughs> uh, and uh, no, but it was... Uh, it was a, it was a great deal and and uh, yeah people I've actually done it live in Chicago I've uh, there's a good there's Donna Rice a great singer in Chicago who mm-hmm. I did a show I did a big show there and, and I asked her if she would like sing the Olivia songs and the Family Ties theme with me because mm-hmm. I never get a chance to do those yeah uh, if, unless I have a woman up there with me so uh, it worked out really great and it, it came off nice and I and it's those those are really good like I said rewarding memories. Uh, to be to be able to do those kind of things, you know, uh, it was a lot of fun to do, and, and it's thirty seconds of of a song. Right, that's all it was. Right. Thirty seconds, and it was powerful. It was worked, you know, it worked, and uh, everybody thought that it was definitely the the people in the show, you know. Now, tell so, me, uh, yeah, it was fun. Tell me a little bit about uh, I hadn't heard about this either. The L.A. Mad Dogs. What is that, Dennis? <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm not at liberty to talk about that. No. <laughs> uh, uh, the L.A. Mad Dogs, well, when I was uh, actually in the 80s and into the 90s, I was doing a lot of well, uh, acting, and, and because of that, we uh, there's a, a thing called ADR looping work, where actors uh, come in, uh, maybe eight, ten actors on a movie, uh, they, they play the movie back on the screen, and uh, in, uh, in movies, I'm going to do a... This is going to kind of like bust the whole movie industry now Mm -hmm. but uh when you see like a couple at a table in a restaurant and they're the lead actors they're the only ones talking and what you see in the background is a completely full restaurant with everybody drinking and laughing and stuff all those people are not making a sound right they're just moving their mouths and because they have to get a clean recording uh on on the principles and then what we do is we come in and improvise around that scene and fill in the background sounds so uh, it, it, the scene comes alive, like they're really in a real place. Right. So, and I did that for, gosh, 15 years just about. So it was very interesting to uh, do that. And, and then, and these were all done by voice contractors, you know, different people hire you and different stuff. Well, it got to the point where there was about four, four of us guys that wanted to go off on our own because we thought we could we could get more specific on certain projects that we could do, and uh, we ended up calling ourselves the Mad Dogs, right. the L.A. Mad Dogs. Yeah, and uh, and that became and I, I I still see the credits on movies on the L.A. Mad Dogs did the you know ADR work. Uh, so that was that was another little uh, project that that came across really well too. And you guys even we were able did. To book ourselves you guys get even our own work. You guys even did some radio dramas though, right? Oh yeah, like old time oh, radio. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we did them at the uh, Gene Autry Museum out here. Cool. And uh, they were live with a three hundred seat audience, live of sound effects, live band, everybody using those big RCA microphones, and uh, we did about eight of those. And then I directed three of them, and uh, it was just uh, a, a, just fun. It was so it was a lot of work, but it was fun to do because the the, the, the theater of the mind came yeah, into play. Oh yeah, no, we we and, love old time radio kind of dramas. We play all those here at the station. Oh, do you? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, we used to do two shows. the The first show, which was uh, uh, well, that we recorded them all, but the first show uh, was kind of like live and on the radio live and then the second show when the first audience left they could get into their cars and turn on the radio and listen <laughs> to the show on the radio ah. so it was like really cool uh, and uh, yeah it was the the imagery was so beautiful in it you know when you think when you look at the stage and a bunch of people rattling things and closing doors on the stage and you know footsteps and then yeah. the actors talking into the microphone it was wonderful yeah it was wonderful and i had a, i had a ball directing so, so and that is so i <clears throat> I was just going to say, having number one hits w- with the Buckinghams, kind of a drag, and, and all those great songs you guys did, I know you wanted to walk away from music for a while, but 
didn't you kind of miss that? I mean, doing loop work and all that's great, and, and the OTR kind of recreations and stuff. But it, you know, yeah. here you are, number one. You know, you had all these girls, you know, passing out in front of you guys <laughs> like you're the Beatles. What kind of a mindset did that make for you? I mean, did did you kind of feel like it was as much of a big deal, or you, you just liked the slower pace more? Uh, you know, it's 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 it was kind of more more or less a uh, a respite. Yeah. You know, what I mean, there you a, go. a little bit of time off uh, because what, what we, when we hit, we were flung into this pop rock situation, and we never stopped for two and a half years. Yeah. And we were on the road all the time, so it was always a break. And then when it did happen, I knew that in the seventies that when the band disbanded, I just took off you know and said okay i'm not going to get all really bitter or any or upset you know right. we were we kind of ran through the the 60s band machine and got ripped off here and there you yeah, know yeah everybody so, did uh, yeah yeah it was it was a typical kind of thing and so so i just you know I, luckily i was surrounded by good friends and my family was very very tight so they 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 allowed me to do what I had to do to be quiet and, and, and not be upset. You know, they didn't yeah. jump on me and say, well, how'd you let that happen, Paul? Yeah. Oh, I didn't get into any of that. So I just became a hippie. There you I go. Mean, I, I, you know, I grew my hair down to my back and, uh, you know, and I just, uh, I was fine. Right. You know, and I started writing songs and I was feeling good. I just didn't know where I was going to go yeah. at that point because it was like the band fell off the stage. Yeah. You well, know, uh, so it was kind of an abrupt ending for us, but but it was it was a tough couple of years at the end because we were we were fighting litigation and all kinds of stuff. So well, what yeah, was it, what was going on with that? I didn't know about litigation. Oh yeah, well we had we had uh, the problems with our manager and publishing, and oh, okay. also yeah. uh, you know we actually what in in a brief uh, description of it, we we all decided that we had been working for two and a half years and we had all these hit records that we should go in and get an accounting of our money mm -hmm. and we all wanted to then take the money and pay off our parents homes oh that's nice yes yeah. and because that you know because they allowed us to do all this and we were like always talking about that on the road like what can we do for our families and uh, we figured we you know that the houses back then were like eighteen thousand dollars yeah sure they were. so you know uh so when we found out that there was no money there it turned into litigation wow yeah. And and you know so that was that was a tough part and uh, that hurt that that was the the roughest part right to, to to you know because we believed that we were supposed to be creative and they were going to take care of the business yeah and they did yeah, yeah they <laughs> did all right so now kind of going along those lines though let let me ask you about how much uh, creative freedom you guys did or didn't have as the Buckinghams we've talked to a lot of artists from the sixties who basically uh -huh. said, yeah, no, the record label told us what to do, what to say, how to sing it, how to dress, how to act. How was it with you guys? How much creative control, if any, did you guys have over what you guys were putting out? Oh, yeah. No, we, we had, we, we, there were some, some uh, skirmishes. Uh, the record, record companies, you know, wanted us to continually re-record kind of a drag. Yeah, of course. You know, so if we came up with something else, they go, that's not kind of a drag. We got to... And you know the fact is is that Jim Holvey, who wrote Kind of a Drag, wrote Don't You Care, Hey Baby, They're Playing Our Song, and Susan. I love all so those two. We had we had a consistency in the songwriting that evolved every time he gave us another song, and it gave us a lot of credibility because we were able to continue. Now the the record company they never told us how to dress or anything. It was our idea to we always dressed up in suits since we were in high school, so. We, uh, you know, I designed all the suits that you see on the TV shows and stuff, uh, and uh, we just loved dressing up all the time. So, and that's what kind of gave us the English kind of feeling too. Yeah. You know? uh, so, and uh, and Nick, the bass player, uh, actually before the band was in Barber College. So if you if you look at some of our our group pictures back then, you'll see that he cut all of our hair. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> And it was kind of the same haircut right. than everybody. Well, it looked good. It looked good. Yeah, it worked fine. I mean, we were able to, like, you know, keep trim uh, yeah. on the road. You know, in the Holiday Inn, we'd be sitting there, and he'd be trimming our hair. So, uh, 
so it would, it would work out fine. Oh, so I told but, Terry uh, the other day, I was like, bands don't look nice anymore like they used yeah, they to. Used they used to, wear to be so and dressed up and look nice. Yeah. 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 Well, see, that's one of the things I like about uh, the kind of genre I'm in right now as the uh, 60s all-stars and all that kind of stuff because everybody from that period dresses up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, everybody dresses up. Nobody comes on with their jeans ripped and, you know, the thing. Now, in the 70s, there was that started to happen. Uh, there was a little bit of time in there where, you know, you started dressing like, well, you didn't really bring any clothes with you. You just came off the street. Yeah. Yeah, right. Looking, and that's how you went on stage. Now, for me, that doesn't work because when I perform, I have to change into a good outfit because I feel like I'm about to go to a party. Right. And and that's going to be a major party for me out there. And why would I walk on overly comfortable in my right. jeans? You know, it doesn't make any sense. So I really do like dressing up for the for the party. What well, what, uh, what about working for the PBS things? Because we've had some other uh, singers, and, and I won't name their names, who did not like the way they did their production because it wasn't the way he wanted. It was they just threw a band at him. It was kind of rushed and. Well, uh, those uh, the PBS thing that I, I did, uh, the Cornerstones of Rock one was was, was very well organized, uh, very expensive production. Now the the TJ Lipinski one that I did, which was uh, '60s My Generation, yeah, uh, <clears throat> there was, you know, uh, I didn't go on stage until like two thirty in the morning, uh, and so it was very <laughs> a little difficult to keep your energy up. <laughs> uh, and so did the audience, which was amazing. They sat there for like six, seven hours too. But but yeah, some some of the bands. So they would shoot all bit. night, right? I mean, it was like a, oh yeah, they yeah. shot from eight o'clock. Wow. To you know the daylight, the because they had to get it done. Yeah. Uh, some of the bands uh, would mess up. Some of the bands uh, got a little bit egoed out about things yeah. and said, "No, we're not going to play that song." So there were delays and things like that. But for the most part. Uh, everybody had a great time. I mean, right. I, it, it was exciting to be on those shows, right? Right. right. Because those are, those are permanent, you know, archives of yeah. what we did, and and they and T J. Lubinsky did a great job on those. So, uh, so the, yeah, they were, yeah. Some of the some of the guys complain a little bit, but you know, there's always room to complain in, in rock and roll. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, before the Buckinghams, probably like one of your greatest bands that, that you guys. Uh, had formed together and probably was that really the genesis of the Buckinghams the Pulsations yeah uh, you know you had to have a band locally in Chicago that sounded like it was moving you right. know uh, <laughs> and you and you because we played dances we played ballrooms and skating rinks and all kinds of stuff VFW halls and it was all about dancing and so the Pulsations was a, was a good happy little name and then uh, we won a battle of the bands in 1965 uh, for WGN TV oh, yeah. in Chicago. Oh yeah, my home ta- my hometown now. station. Yeah, yeah. WGN and WLS go. Radio. That's it. Yeah, and so they had a show called All Time Hits, and it was basically a, a very minimalistic show because there was no heavy recording back then on TV for music. But they had you know standard singers, Broadway singers, pop singers, uh, and then they needed a band to be the rock and roll portion. So, and so every week that we would be on the show, we would have to learn one of the songs that was in the top five that day, that week. Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, we uh, we were in rehearsals uh, about three days, and uh, they came up to us, the producers came up to us and said, look at the, you know, with the uh, British invasion happening, uh, do you, is there a possibility that you might be able, before we tape the show and do all that, uh, could you change your name to sound a little bit more English? Oh, there we go. <laughs> I already thought yeah. you were English, and, and wow. <laughs> so we said, well, you know, we don't want to be fake about yeah. it, right. you know, and stuff. And uh, and and uh, so we said, we'll think about it. And the next day, the security guard came up to us, a young guy who had suspiciously long hair for 1965. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, you know he could have been in Iowa with us, yeah. <laughs> and and what happened was is he came up to us and said, "Look, I heard what they asked you." And he says, "So at home, I wrote down a couple of names. Maybe you you know maybe it'll inspire you or something." We said, "Great, thanks." And uh, so we looked at the list, and there were some really cool names on there and stuff. But the Buckinghams jumped out because we went, "Well, wait a second. In Chicago and Grand Park, we've got the Great Buckingham Fountain." 
which is a, a landmark. It turns colors at night. It's mm-hmm. gigantic. Right. Yeah. It's really beautiful. I didn't even think so about that. Said, well, that yeah. wouldn't be bad. We got one foot in, in Chicago, and we got Buckingham's, which sounds like the palace. So why not? Then we're not really, you know, cheating here. So we changed our name to the Buckingham's, and that show <laughs> billed us all the time as the royalty in rock and roll, the Buckingham's. <laughs> <laughs> and and then uh, you know nothing came of it. Nobody started talking about us being English or anything. But then we were we were called to do the Smothers Brothers show. Right. And and on the show they don't interview you. Know? They just let you play your songs and you. I had to sing live to them, but uh, they. Uh, so we walk into the to the studio and and Tommy Smothers comes up and we're like blown away because we love Tommy Smothers. He's a funny guy. And he says, I'm so happy you guys could make it. We're so big fans of your songs. We said, we're big fans of your... And he goes, where's your accents? <laughs> we said, what accents? And he goes, we, we thought you were English. Mm. We said, well, no, no, we, we have accents. They're Chicago accents. You know, but they're... And he said, but look at the set we built. Oh, God. And they, they opened the curtain, and it was all Union Jacks. Oh, oh my God. The biggest set in the world. And he said, we're going to have to change this set. And we said, no, 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 don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We have another song without that set. Yeah. We'll be fine. And But ever since people saw us, it was me and Marty Greb singing Mercy, Mercy, Mercy. And it was all Union Jacks in back of us. Wow. And it just solidified that we were English. Right. Yeah, you could have and done a so tour with all acts and wore costumes like you and... Uh, uh, Gary Puckett and Union Gap and Paul Revere and the Raiders and, and called it the British Invasion yeah. the not yeah. British Invasion <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, was, it was pretty crazy you know that's like funny we, we actually well, we, we would do our shows uh, on the road and we would have to tell people oh by the way you know we're not English <laughs> and they didn't care <laughs> you know nobody really cared wow. uh, but uh, yeah it was one of those things and some people got on us uh, thinking that we did it to, to cash in right Right. Uh, but that wasn't the case at all no it was uh, and it, it worked out fine you know it was a good name to have well as we come close to an end here how about some of your uh, recent recordings I know you recorded afterwards as a solo act as Dennis Dufano so talk about some of your releases you put out you know on your own oh well the uh, wow! What did I do? I actually, <laughs> I actually did a, a disco album. Really? Uh, yes. Oh, wow! Uh, All right. Uh, but it was like a friend of mine from Chicago, Ross Salamone. He was a great drummer. He was actually with the Bangor Flying Circus out of Chicago, uh-huh. and he was in L.A. and I and I was I walked up to him and he said uh, we hadn't seen each other for twenty years. And he said, what are you doing? And I told him, and I was singing, writing, doing some work. And stuff. He goes, you know, I'm doing this album. He says, it's a disco album. He says, please don't hate me for that. <laughs> he, said, but, he said, but he says, the, the, the guy that they have singing is, is kind of monotonous, and they really want some, some style to it. They want something. And I said, I don't, I'm not going to do a disco record, man. I'm sorry. I just don't understand it. And he said, no, but here's the deal. He said, the name of the album is called Bernadette. And it's the four tops, you know, Bernadette, yeah. and, right. and, and I'll be and I'll be there. And I went, oh, I'll love to sing those songs. Yeah, you know. So so that was my my bait, and I and I went in there and I did it. And it, and, but it it's Bernadette segues right into like a thirty seven minute wow. <laughs> middle of it, like a disco thing, and then it goes into I'll be there, and and uh, it's it's. It was unbelievable. It was the longest song I ever had. Oh, sing. we need to be finding and, that. <laughs> oh, yeah, you'll find it someplace. It's Bernadette, uh, uh, I'll Be There. It was called The JT Connection was the name of the album. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's and, and it, those two songs I really like. I mean, it was the fastest song that I've ever seen. Yeah. Because I was and, surprised but, even, even our friend Ron Dante did a disco album. Yes, he did. Yeah, yes, he did. And I work with Ron a lot too. Yeah, we, it's, uh, yeah, he did one too, and we we actually laughed about that. And we said, let's <laughs> let's keep that quiet, okay? Let's right. keep it quiet. Yeah. Uh, and 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 uh, but nobody really, I mean, nobody really heard it. It wasn't a commercial success, but it was a big. It was number one mm. in discos all over the world. Wow. Yeah, mm. and I didn't get paid for that. Wow. I got paid for the sessions, but the record company disappeared right after this stuff came out so what's your uh, uh well you know you're kind of you're kind of interesting and unique in the fact that you actually are still friends 
with Gia Marisi and Nick and all of yeah. them. Like a lot of times we talk to, you know, people from bands and we they, on the they show. hate each other. They don't want anything uh, to do with each other. Uh, so you guys are oh, all, yeah. all, all good with each other. So now let me ask you, when somebody goes to see Dennis, to see you perform, uh, what are they in store for? Are they going to hear any of the Buckingham songs or you kind of leave those to the current incarnation of the Buckingham? A lot of your people that's done hits with a group and they're on their own, they don't want to do it. They don't them. want to, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I definitely sing them because they, uh, well, for legal reasons and everything else, uh, they have to, to build me as Dennis Stefano, the original voice of. Yeah. Right. Uh, and this way, so people know then that I'm the singer. Now, Carl does a decent job from what people tell me. I haven't really seen him perform except the little time we played at on the, the, the PBS thing. But, uh, and, they, and they've been doing it for a long time. And people seem to love them as the Buckingham. So I can't fault them for what they're doing at all. But he doesn't sound like me uh, because I sound like me. Right. Yes. And, and, and so that's, that's, and I do every Buckingham song. I do all the way down to I'll Go Crazy, which was one of our first singles out of Chicago, a James Brown song. And I do that as an encore a lot. And uh, and I bring in, uh, I try to bring in a lot of our stuff, like uh, one of our last singles that Marty Greb wrote uh, before we, we disbanded was called Back in Love Again. And it's a great song, and I do that one live now. And I actually do some Chicago songs, you know, uh, Saturday Night in the Park. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, it's uh, so yeah. I do. I do a mix of all the Buckingham's hits and some buried Buckingham stuff, and then I do, uh, you know, Bobby Darin. I do uh, some Rascals. Nice. Uh, I, I, the, the nice thing about, like I said earlier, the nice thing about being a solo act is that you can pick and choose some songs that you really love and right. enjoy doing. Yeah. Right. It's, I, 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 I've never really just put songs in a show because I thought everybody would dig it you know i just I, if i got into them uh i learned something in the in the in, of course the buckingham songs were the same way lyrically they were very very see uh 50 some years later i can still sing kind of a drag and mean it and don't you care and mean it and it doesn't sound like i'm an old guy singing a young guy's song yeah so there's something very fortunate about that you know because like even uh, I know when Ron Dante sometimes when he has to sing Tracy <laughs> when he was in the cufflinks it's you know it's a little bit bopper you yeah. know right and uh, he understands that but but Ron he carries it off with so much I don't know I think it's intelligence the way he, he's just very uh, he doesn't judge any of that material right you know yeah. and and he, he when he does it I go I like that song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I really like that. I, song. I was surprised so, to hear that Ron's uh, substituting for one of the members of the Turtles, which was yeah, surprising to well, me. Yeah, well, he was he was doing the Happy Together tour, yeah. and then Howard got sick, and he said, "I don't think I could tour anymore." And they approached him and said, "Look at Ron, you're you're in great shape. Your voice is perfect. And uh, would you mind, uh, you know, being one of the Turtles now?" Now, see, yeah, with, with me, I'd worry about I'd, I'd worry about my own legacy being swaddled up because he's got enough on his own that he's famous for that I wouldn't want to just. No, but well, you know, but he did the tour for a couple of years before that, and as as Ron Dante, you know, and uh, and I think everybody enjoyed his work. So the fact that he now could be singing Howard's stuff, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, and and still doing his stuff is a cool thing and, yeah. and uh, you know he, he the thing with, with like I understand what you're saying about that is, yeah. but he has no ego yeah right. no he doesn't no he, he doesn't. doesn't one of the no. best guys ever he just is so wonderful yeah yeah I mean yeah. we we had been trying to find each other for years yeah. and we had mutual friends out here in Los Angeles and they kept saying you know Ron Dante came in and I go Ron Dante I've been trying to find him <laughs> and it's like and you, and you know where we actually met where at the T.J. Lubinsky taping Oh. that we talked about earlier yeah oh. he was there and he came out and he said dennis and i said ron <laughs> and that was it it was like we actually finally met yeah and uh and and now we uh yeah we actually we've done some shows together where where he comes up and sings uh you know songs with me and we we mercy mercy sometimes he'll sing with me uh and we have a ball together he's yeah. a really good guy yeah really solid I, was, I was very smart Sorry to see uh, yeah. about uh, the death that you mentioned on Facebook. Was that one of your fans, or 
Which one was that? Uh, you, the other day, you you there said was a you, post on the fa- on your Facebook page. It was talking. I believe it was about one of one of your fans in the community who had passed away. Oh yes, yes. I, I just wanted to mention that only to say that that shows what a great guy you are. You know oh, that you're that well, close with your fans. It's wonderful. It really is. Yeah. Well, no that 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 lady that that passed was was uh, I I met her ten years ago and her husband. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, they were just wonderful people. I mean, they turned into fans very, uh, you know, they, they, they moved from fanship to friendship. Right. Yeah, and, uh, and they were very, very caring people, very good people. And I'm always, a, a, you know, a sucker for good-hearted people. They're, and because I, I love people. And yeah. so I, I, you know, and then, yeah, they, they do it. It's been a rough year because we've lost so many people. Yeah. Uh, in the business and friendship wise it's right. it's it's been a very rough couple of years yeah. actually yeah. yeah and so it's 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 i always try to find a, a space to somehow you know gather up that pain and that that frustration that we feel that we can't help somebody you know yeah well that, uh, that's but, that's midwest values too coming from the yeah, chicago area yeah. myself yes absolutely yeah, exactly people need exactly. to know that that's, that's us that's, I, I tell people all the time, I had nothing to do with it. That's how I was brought up. That's <laughs> right. Well, we're, yeah. we're looking forward to you getting back out there in the community, but take it slow and be careful. Like you said, October, I think yeah. things are yeah, going to be better. Yeah. And meanwhile, I can't wait. This has been the longest year and a half I've ever spent. I know, yeah. right? Uh, you've yeah. got a great website. You've got, like, I saw, like, a Dennis Tufano Rocks t shirt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got yeah. merch. So, what's yeah, some of your favorite merch. items you got? Please. T-shirts. And, oh, we just got. We got. We, oh, there's always new T-shirts coming up. Yeah. We always try to keep uh, keep them rotating. Uh, but those are the fans. Those are people that that came up and said, you know, you should have T-shirts. I yeah, said, yeah, yeah, I know. I just don't have time. And all of a sudden, the next gig they come to, they got T-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, wait, you're manufacturing these things for me. You didn't, you didn't even ask me. You know, but they do nice work, and well, they they well, are very respectful, and and it's almost like a family. There's there's yeah. a family feeling to all this music, between the acts and the fans. You know, one of the great things, and I know we have to go. Uh, the great things about being able to go out and tour now, is that all the fans, you know, as we all have a, a soundtrack to our lives. Yeah. All the fans have stories connected to the songs. Right. Yeah. And we never had that before, and we never had the time after the shows to talk to people and now they come up and they go kind of a drag you know what happened and you see a couple and they were they were married on the day they heard kind of a drag or something you know there's such thing that plugs them in and when they tell me these stories it's so heartfelt that i'm just going oh god i I really did something good that's right you know it's like you, you thought you were just making music and and you know but that was there was much more going on, so that's a great thing. That's a, that's a great legacy to have. That that people have uh, you know respect and, and this this warmth about what you've done. It's, it's only three and, minutes. And now now that uh, your your fans are making T-shirts, uh, you've reached Grateful Dead status <laughs> because that's what the Grateful Dead fans do. So that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. 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 Well, Dennis, I uh, want to yeah. thank you so much for spending some time with us, especially on a holiday oh, weekend. Uh, yeah. If yes. if our listeners, yeah, that's not a problem. Not a problem. Uh, this is like going on the road for me. It's, uh, <laughs> it's something to talk about the music because I, I just sit around uh, trying to open up bottles of wine. It's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, well li- it is kind. Of, it's kind of fun. <laughs> <you know. laughs> if listeners want to check out Dennis's website, you could head over to dtsings.com. Uh, I think we'll have to drop over there and get a copy of the uh, the Bobby Darren stuff. I want to yeah. I want to hear that. I love you uh, doing yeah. Bobby Darren. And then yeah, you're you're you very. Know? What I was just gonna say, you're very active on Facebook. Everybody wants to go over to your Facebook page. Yes. Yeah, go to the Facebook page uh, that has a lot of stuff, and and, uh, and uh, my, the website, the DT Sings one, it is a little bit uh, problematic right now. We're having trouble adjusting it, but there's another one, uh, uh, Dennis Stefano Rocks. Okay. Dot Perfect. com. And and uh, this girl Kathy Hudson uh, does that show. Uh, she puts that thing together. It's got everything on it that you would have, along with the Facebook page. is a good place to go. And you'll see T-shirts and CDs and and videos and pictures. It's just it's kind of a fun family little uh, setup. So well, much Perfect. appreciation and, uh, to Kathy for sure. Yes. And I assume that people can purchase uh, signed CDs, right? 
Oh yeah, I mean we could we could work that out. I think there's a thing on the on the uh, shopping thing on the Facebook page. I know I have uh, been sent addresses and things like that, <laughs> and I'd have to sign uh, some some CDs and send them off to people. So yeah, they could do that, or they can go to CD Baby or iTunes, and they you know if they want digital. But if you want the, the CD, which is kind of fun, right? Uh, you know, and I and I I sell them at the shows also too. So, uh, but again. Uh, Terry, uh, Tiffany, thank you so much for inviting me on the show. It's it's really a pleasure to talk to you. Absolutely, it's thank been you, a brother. Lot music, of fun. God, your music just means so much to me. I, those are just legendary songs that'll never die. Well, you guys are out here in L.A., right? Yes, yes, we are. Well, well, let's put on our masks and get together and have lunch. Sounds we good. We should to me. do that definitely. All right. All right. All right. I got your number. I'll I'll bug you. Sounds okay. good. Uh, thank you again, Dennis, and have a great rest of your weekend and a happy fourth. Yes, happy 4th to you. Be safe. You too. All right. right. Bye-bye. Bye.